Hey everybody, Ed Holmwood, Old Guy Hi-Fi channel. Hope everyone's doing well today. Today we're gonna to talk about a really interesting product, the Cord Cutest DAC. And it uses a different kind of technology to do its decoding. So why don't you sit back, relax, and we're gonna talk about the Cord Cutest. So the Cord Cutest DAC is actually a very remarkable product. It is extraordinarily well constructed. It's extraordinarily well thought out and really, really unique in that the way it decodes the audio signal. This doesn't use a chip based Delta Sigma DAC. It doesn't use a multi bit DAC. It doesn't use a resistor ladder DAC. It uses an entirely different and unique uh, way of doing it called an FPGA. And we'll talk about that in just a second. And before we talk about that, what I'd like to do is ask you, if you like the video, please give me a like and a subscribe. And if you wish to support the channel, there is a thank you button and there are membership links in the pinned comment and the description of the video. Thank you very much in advance. So the Cord Cutis does things a bit different than most other DACs. There are other DACs that use FPGAs, but the thing about an FPGA is the designer of the product can make it sound the way he wants it to. It's not an off the shelf product. So the DAC itself can do 32 bit 768. It can do DSD 512. It has a very uh, high signal noise ratio at a great dynamic range. It has all of those wonderful things that you would expect from a premium DAC costing almost 1600 bucks. But by using an FPGA, it's really, really unique because FPGA stands for Field Programmable Gate Array. And basically what it is, it is a configurable integrated circuit that uses a series of logic blocks on a grid that the designer of the device can program to do exactly what he wants. So FPGAs are used in aerospace, telecommunications, military applications, automotive applications. Tons are used in research and development because again, the field programmable portion of its name gives you a hint in that it can be updated in the field. It can be updated on the fly more or less. So if the designer of the DAC wants to change a parameter in its decoding process or a parameter in its sound signature, they can do it. You just flash the device and you get basically like a new DAC without changing the chip. So it's really unique that way and it's really well constructed. And I think, uh, it shows in the materials they use. This is a solid piece of machined billet aluminum. It's just remarkable. And I'm going to turn it around and show you that goes into and goes out is uh, five volt in, it's two amp, five volt in. So you can't run this off a cell phone charger. Single ended RCA, Spitifon Toslink, Spitifon coax, but BNC, twist and lock, and then USB-B. And that's the way I used it most of the time. The USB-B can be connected to your MacBook or your PC, and that's how I used it. When it's lit up green like this, I can change the output voltage by pushing down and holding, and I can do one volt, two volt, or three volt. Almost the entire time I had it, I did it at two volt because it better level matched other products I was comparing it against. The user interface is a little bit odd because it's color coded and I had to refer to the owner's manual quite frequently. But in all honesty, I just used it on USB in, which is what you see here in green. And most of the time it has four filters. So it has a neutral filter, slightly less neutral filter, a slightly warm filter and a slightly warmer filter. Most of the time I found myself using it on the slightly less neutral or the slightly warm filter with really good results. And let's talk about those results. I just recently reviewed the Denifrips Pontus and I recently reviewed the Audiolab MDAC Plus. Um, the, I've talked about in the Pontus how the low frequency reproduction was very natural and nuanced. Well, using the same recording of the big pipe organ in Paris, this did a better job resolving low bass information. I'll be honest with you, it did a better job of resolving all information throughout the frequency response range than the Pontus did. Um, they're both comparably priced. This is about $1,600, I think, street price. Pontus, the, the 12, uh, the Pontus 2 12H is, about, it was about the same street price. I think they've gone up a little bit. So they're very comparable in price ways, but performance wise, as good as upon us is, and don't get me wrong, that thing is remarkably good. This is actually a little bit better, I think. This is actually one of the best acts I've ever heard. I've never heard a nine or a 10 but I would say this is a good eight and a half. And the differences between this and most other DACs in its price category, I think are a couple of different things. It is 
whatever the decoding signal that it outputs is 100%, I think 100% neutral and accurate, not lifeless, but just gives you, gives your, the rest of the chain, the audio chain, a perfect signal to reproduce. And if the rest of your chain has any shortcomings in it, the signal this gives them can point out those shortcomings. And it's kind of interesting that way. So I used it primarily two ways. I used it with the Evo 150, which I think is a super revealing, very high-end audiophile sound product. Excellent amplification, excellent preamplifier, excellent resolution. And I also, for fun, and kind of the more romantic side of it, is I used it in the warmest filter mode, and I ran it into the uh, Sparkos Gemini headphone amp preamp with a tube in it into the Galleon TSA 75. That was very nice, very kind of lush, but not, you know, not, not muddy or not masked sound. It was accurate, neutral, and, and very clean, but very warm and nice and, you know, easy to just kind of stop thinking about the gear you're listening to and just listen to the music. With the Evo, though, it did some remarkable things in, com in comparison to the Pontus. They both threw a very good sound stage width wise, comparable 100%. Both had laser focused center images, comparable 100%. Where I found the Pondus fell a bit short was in image depth. It was a good deep image and probably better than most DACs as far as image depth. But this thing just went another distance further. It, went, it was very deep and very nuanced and very accurate. And while the Pondus did a good job of instrument location in space, this did a better job of instrument location in space. I felt like I could point much more accurately to where those instruments were located in the soundstage with this than I could with the Pontus. And in that regard, this does maybe best my Bifrost a bit because the Bifrost does a legendary job with imaging. And this does a better job low frequency than the Bifrost. They're comparable and at probably I've been listening to Bifrost for so long, I probably have a predisposition for its sound. So I will grant that. But this was probably better. Yeah, no, it was better. Um, is it enough to make me want to buy one? <laughs> it's close. Anyway, so this did just a remarkable job all the way through the frequency response range. So one of the things that I listened for in piano recordings and like this one from Martha, and I'll, I'll, I'll mess up her last name, so I apologize, but she is an absolute virtuoso and has been for her whole life. Her piano concertos and her work with Beethoven, like this recording here, is just absolutely stunning. And when she hits the piano, and when, you know, if your sustenuto pedal is pushed and you hit that note, it hangs in the air. And this, the note, those notes hang in, hung in the air longer on this, more naturally on this than any other DAC I've ever heard. And when they decayed, they decayed so smoothly and detailed that you could just almost right to the point where it vanished, you could still hear that decay. It was remarkable. You could hear the body of the, the, the concert Steinway or the concert, concert Bosendorfer she was playing. Just remarkable uh, reproduction there. And another one is too, one of the things, dynamic range has, a, a, there's a number of different things in dynamic range. The first piece in the chain, and I'm a source first guy, is obviously this would be the, the PC is the first source, but Artivan is bit perfect, so I don't worry about that. So this would be the first link in the chain. And I think from a dynamic range standpoint, this will then determine the dynamic range of the rest of the system. If it doesn't match the dynamic range of the amplifier, the amplifier just doesn't need to obviously produce that much dynamics. But this can exceed the dynamic range of your amplifier, depending on the amplifier and the type and configuration. So from a dynamic range standpoint, it was remarkable. Now, this recording um, by Andre Previn and the London Symphony Orchestra, Vaughn Williams, A London Symphony, starts out at a whisper and then builds into this big crescendo. And this had the dynamic range to reproduce that very, very accurately. I thought it was remarkable and detailed and nuanced. And just, again, I, you know, I talk about mass strings or, or instruments all in the mid-range getting kind of confused sounding, not with this. Um, not with this, not with the Evo, not with the big wharf tails. They did an exemplary job of reproducing that very, very pleasingly. Now, another recording I use, which is kind of more in the ambient techno weird stuff that I like to listen to, this one from Hooven Network live at Glastonbury, is kind of dreamy, sort of flowy, sort of uh, ambient techno music. But I was listening to it and I was just kind of not concentrating, but all of a sudden I started hearing some de inner detail in the synths and all of the other programming they were doing 
that I'd really not noticed before. So that was a real revelation for me. And I really, really enjoyed that a lot. So this is absolutely a remarkable device and I enjoyed my time with it. It's not mine. I have to give it back to someone. It is a tempting unit to want to own, but really, really good. I really enjoyed my time with it. So that's the Cord Cutis. I hope you enjoyed the video. If you did, please give me a like and a subscribe. If you want to support the channel, you can. There's a thank you button at the bottom of the video window and there's membership links in the pinned comment and in the description of the video. There are also affiliate links in the description of the video and you know how those work. And there are some playlists down there of my reference tracks and I'll be adding to that. Thank you for everybody who sent me a playlist. I've gotten some wonderful music. I would encourage you to continue to do so. And I think that's about everything I need to say. Oh, like, subscribe, comment, follow me on Instagram if you want to. I'm Ed Homewood, Old Guy Hi-Fi Channel, saying it's now time for you to go listen to some music, maybe on a really, really wonderful sounding digital analog converter. Thanks so very much and have a great day. Oh,